This is a conversation with Anika Rolick. Anika is the director of engineering at Aurelia Institute, a non-profit space architecture R&D lab, education and outreach center, and a policy hub dedicated towards building humanity's future in space. In this conversation, we discuss what life in space habitats might look like in the future, right from the daily chores like brushing your teeth, cooking or cleaning, all the way to bigger problems like politics, governance, art, architecture, music, love and relationships. We talk about some of the current limitations around the designs for space habitats, the engineering and design challenges behind building self-assembling structures like the Tesseray project, and we also get our thoughts on the space race. This is no time. If you like what you see, then do hit subscribe on YouTube, follow on Spotify or rate five stars on Apple Podcasts. This project takes as much time and effort as a second job. So if you'd like to see it continue, do consider making a donation on Patreon, Anchor, Instagram. You can also become a member on YouTube. If not through monetary channels, then do consider sharing these episodes, leaving your likes and comments. All forms of engagement, they really go a long way. For other forms of love and support, you can follow this channel on Instagram or Twitter or follow me personally. And now finally, it's no time. I want to start with the game slash thought experiment. Let's imagine the year is 2075. I'm living on this space habitat and I'm hiring you as my oracle slash consultant to help me visualize this picture. You're someone who's thought deeply about living on space or living in space or living on space habitats. So I'm going to list down one category at a time of things I can do in space. I would love to get your thoughts on what that might look like, how that might be different as compared to what. Are you ready? Yeah. Great. Too late to back out. Okay. First, let's start with the daily routine. Let's assume I've just woken up on a space habitat. What would my daily routine look like? Just the small chores like brushing, showering, cooking, cleaning. How does that change on space if it changes at all? Right now, the way we live in space is very structured. It's very schedule based. Um, it's kind of an orchestrated dance with your other crew members. So, you know, if someone's in um, using, you know, the hygiene area or someone else is using the exercise equipment, you have to work around their schedule. Um, and so 50 years from now, um, hopefully we are living in slightly bigger locations in space. So there might be more opportunity for you to work out in tandem, maybe with a crewmate. Um, there definitely is still that need to, to exercise usually around two hours a day. Um, a lot of that is to mitigate the effects of microgravity. And so that looks like uh, strength training and aerobic training, um, to combat some of the heart deconditioning, some of the bone loss and muscle atrophy. Um, so generally wake up would probably look like you, know, you wake up, you brush your teeth, yeah. you get your gym clothes on, you go to the treadmill and you strap yourself down on the treadmill because you need bungees and you uh, maybe run for a bit, maybe you cycle for a bit, listen to some music, um, maybe you do some strength training, um, change clothes, do your hygiene. Um, they've tried showers in space. Astronauts have actually found that showers are usually more trouble than they're worth. And really? so, yeah, Skylab <laughs> okay. had a shower. Um <laughs> And it was a it was a process. It was a whole thing. <laughs> so um, it probably will look closer to a sponge bath potentially. But remember, you're not necessarily sweating as much because it's just not as much work to be done against gravity. Um, and so that's kind of the the big chore of the day is really keeping your body body fit. Um, once that's done, you're probably taking breakfast with your crewmates. Um, social social gatherings, especially around um, kind of makeshift tables and makeshift breaking bread in space, is really um, really, really important. And that's yeah. not really going to change in 50 years, like having, you know, a multicultural chance for a crew, probably an international crew to sit down, um, and eat around a table is really important. Um, breakfast is a little bit maybe more flexible because people are off doing their things immediately right after. So maybe you're passing crewmates in the galley, um, saying hi, you're maybe checking the news on your tablet. So yeah. thinking about, you know, what's, what's cracking down on earth. Um, <laughs> maybe you're looking at correspondences from your family. Um, you know, our communication systems are only getting better with, with, um, space habitats. And so being able to maybe video call or voice call your family, um, would be an opportunity for that. Um, and then you start your day. And so the day is probably anywhere from eight to 10 hours. If it's a science mission, you're doing, uh, blocks of different science, um, Right now, the way astronauts do their work is that it's structured depending on, you know, a myriad of different different experiments, um, either NASA based or other payloads that are flying from different companies. Yeah. Um, and that's probably going to be very similar. Um, and so maybe they're testing out a new um, centrifuge for artificial gravity. And so they'll spend some time in the centrifuge trying to 
uh, read or do other activities while being spun around, or they'll be doing kind of a cutting edge biotechnology experiment. Um, they might be growing crystals in space. They might be doing uh, research for to cure like a new rare blood cancer or something like that. That's another big application. Um, and so that will be most of your day <laughs> with some time for lunch. Um, and right now the way, you know, a lot of the free time is structured is that it's really fighting against uh, maintenance blocks. Um, there's a lot of maintenance that happens on, sta on the space station, the ISS. Um, and so that's usually one to usually two hours a day uh, per astronaut, which is a lot. Um, it's often the uh, life support systems break, um, the toilet breaks a lot. <laughs> so you have these sort of high critical high criticality uh, systems that you need to fix. And so <laughs> the aim in the future is that these systems aren't breaking as much. Yeah. Um, or we have maybe enough of a crew size where you have folks that are really there who are specialized. And so you have people who are there um, as a maintenance crew on rotation. Um, and, you know, Aurelia likes to envision this sort of like technology research stations where you'd have people who are there for doing science in the lab, but then you have folks who are also rotating through as commercial um, spaceflight participants, people who are there on leisure. So their day is going to look a lot different. Maybe they're doing photography. Maybe they're doing art. Um, they're doing a lot of the really highly inspirational activities that astronauts love to do in their free time. Yeah. But right now, career astronauts are really busy with their, um, all those, you know, things breaking, their science. Um, and so they get the chance to do that as they're like weak in space, right? You mentioned so many interesting things and I want to go to each of them one yeah. by one. Let's start with the food. Obviously I'm going to be most interested in that. So what are the different options for food that I have breakfast? You spoke about breakfast. Um, what are some of the most common dishes that we would expect in space and something that you just can't dream of? Yeah, I think, you know, through, through really diligent efforts from different space agencies, um, basically every cuisine has been attempted in space. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, chatter on the space station about, you know, okay, the Europeans have the best food. And so <laughs> like I'll trade yeah. for the, you know, Italian caviar or whatever they have. Right. Yeah. Um, and so food has gotten better, uh, mostly cause that's a huge psychological thing, right. Is having, you know, pretty bad food for months on end. Um, and so I think in the future, we'll see more and more food produced in situ, so grown in space. Um, that way you can get more reliable, fresh produce. Um, flavor is a big thing. So when you're exposed to microgravity for a long period of time, um, the fluid shift often leads astronauts to be a little bit congested. And so they'll lose their sense of taste a little bit um, for the first really kind of indefinitely. Um, and wow. so spice is really big because spice yeah. is something that you can still taste. Um, and so like sriracha is basically gold up there, <laughs> like hot peppers, <laughs> mustard greens, things that are a little bit bitter. Um, so we'll see more and more of, uh, I think, those types of things grown in situ also. And then let's say I've done all my daily chores and maintenance work and I'm looking for a break. What are my options in terms of recreation, entertainment, leisure? What could I do on a space habitat? Yeah. So right now, the biggest thing is the window. Just go to the window and look out. Um, and I think... That's not really likely to change too much um, because the whole point is that you're experiencing space and our, our planet from above, right? And so more, you know, I think having more opportunities for that, more windows or uh, the chance to go and sit by the window to do photography, yeah. um, to kind of pursue your artistic hobbies in space, I think is important. A lot of astronauts also bring right now like their musical instruments. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really beautiful is like seeing Astronaut Katie Coleman play the flute in space is really cool. Um, so I think well, that's likely to be the same. You brought up photographers, artists, musicians. We have to go there now and I'm going to blame it on you. What would art in space look like? Would, how would you, would it change the way we create art and also the way we consume it? I think so. I think it already has, right? And I think the space age changed a lot of the way we, we consume science fiction, the way we think about progress in a lot of media with books. Um, in terms of art moving forward, we, Aurelia thinks a lot about art in space. Yeah. Um, you know, we'd love to think about what would an opera house look like in space? Yeah. Um, how would you build a stage? Because you don't need it to be two dimensional anymore. You have performers who could potentially be suspended right in the middle of a habitat. Um, what would the costumes look like? How do you take advantage of a zero gravity environment yeah. to use the whole space, right? Um, so I think 
there's also been work at, at MIT in the media lab of an instrument that can only be played in microgravity. And so you have kind of this sort of new way of thinking about um, art and how we engage with it in the, the environment that you're in. You mentioned that Aurelia puts a lot of emphasis on beauty in space. I want to take a digression here. What role does beauty play? What power does beauty have? Let's imagine there's a space cathedral and the primary objective for it is aesthetics. Like it just has to look good. How would you justify investing all those resources and spending all that money to build a building that's main object objective is just looking good? How do you quantify that impact of beauty? I think that's an interesting question. Um, I think, you know, in the past, we, we still appreciate these buildings that have gone up, like the Hagia Sophia or the... Notre Dame or, you know, these buildings that existed and maybe were regarded as a colossal waste of church funds in some sure. cases. <laughs> um, but still people are going and, you know, walk inside the, um, you know, Sagrada Familia church and you walk in there and you're like, oh, wow, this is beautiful. Um, and you can't really, I think, understate the permanence of that sort of thing. Even, even farther back, if you think about like the Great Wall or like Machu Picchu, these ruins that are still in existence, um, and you can see that someone wanted to create something. And additionally, they wanted to create something that wasn't just practical. They wanted to go farther. And I think humanity has always wanted to, to infuse beauty and art into the ways we build structures and the way we, we live in places. And I think that's just part of who we are because it, it makes, it's kind of part of that human experience of living in a place is like putting our fingerprint on it a little bit, you know, cave painting handprint on it. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's not necessarily a conversation about monetary value of like wasting money and decoration so much as how do we merge form and function in the way that we do things, um, in the way that we construct, you know, our living spaces, our workspaces, yeah. even extending that to space, you know? Yeah. Why bring the monetary values? Because it just costs so much more in space. Like it's measured, payloads are measured by the gram. So this question of, investing resources becomes, I guess it gets amplified 10x more when you're building buildings just for beauty in space. And I'm sure that's going to come up at some point, but you feel like there is a case to be made about just building beautiful structures, no matter what the cost is, because the feeling it evokes is much more powerful. Yeah. And I think there's, there's, a, there's stepping points on the way between, uh, like a colossal waste of space and resources and a purely functional, Thing. There's there's a, there's, a, there's a gradient in there, right? And you yeah. can you can definitely find a, a sweet spot in the middle there. Um, I did a lot of thinking about cost to orbit and cost benefit for my my PhD work a while ago, and it was um, in kind of the context of going to Mars. And there's a little bit of well, like if you're gonna go and you're gonna do this mission, there's a minimum cost that you just have to accept because you got to launch it. You got to launch something, and it's got to go to Mars. And so even though mass is still a huge influence on how we think about launching things to space. Um, it's sort of like you're launching a lot already. <laughs> um, and so it's not necessarily like a robotic exploration mission where you're minimizing, you know, you know, a ton or a few tons. It's like, you just need multiple tens of tons of material. Um, and at that point it's like, you know, not saying that we should make our, our landers on Mars look like, uh, like really, really and beautiful, um, I don't think we're at that stage yet. You need to have the infrastructure there, but um, yeah. there's definitely a sort of maybe sunk cost is the way you think about it, but that's the way I think about it a bit. You mentioned the sweet spot. Do you think we have to reevaluate what that sweet spot might be? Because there's a generally accepted baseline for what's considered beautiful. You mentioned some great monuments that examples of beautiful monuments, but in space it's, it might be likely that we see buckyballs or plesiohedrons or the nautilus shape these are shapes that are not conventional in architectural structures on earth do you think we'll have to like there's a learning component involved where we have to open ourselves up to these newer structures to actually find them beautiful compared to the structures that we have on earth i think so i think there's going to be a bit of a learning curve of what yeah. is beautiful in space because it's just going to be built differently in space um something else that we think a lot about is materiality and I think maybe like minimalism and kind of patina is like the word I would use. It's like when you have a, like a leather jacket or like a stone that wears over time or like a wood that wears over time. Yeah. And how do you, you know, in, in, on earth, I feel like a lot of the late 20th century, 21st century has been like fighting against nature into like, a you know, between brutalism and now kind of our modern minimalist aesthetic, um, 
where you see apartments that are like mostly steel and like painted over wood and white and clean and, and sparse. And some people really like that. And I, I do appreciate a nice minimalist space. Um, like this office is, is pretty minimal in a lot of ways. But I think if the more we think about living in space, the more we're pushing against this sort of sterile lab environment. Because it's already like that. And we're trying to reinfuse natural elements, things like maybe not wood, because uh, yeah. the Soviets tried to use wood in a space station and it like, didn't work out too well. <laughs> uh, it messes with the humidity pretty aggressively. Um, and so how do you... Th add things that patina over time, things that are natural elements, biophilia, plants, um, even just things that are maybe people don't regard as squishy or as a beautiful, like squishy things or organic looking things. Because, you know, if you don't like nature, or you don't like algae and things like that, maybe you don't find that beautiful. Yeah. But if your whole environment is sterile and all you want to do is think about, you know, some undersea life or the way you engage with nature, I think infusing that back end is like taking that natural beauty and all of the the roughness that comes with that and putting it in a space. I love it. I, I am always a big believer in the power of beauty, this whole form of function debate. And I really like the fact that you guys are actually thinking about beauty. And that's one of the factors that it's given a lot of weight. So we spoke about these cathedrals. I'm in my space habitat. I've done all my chores. I've relaxed in the habitat. I want to go to one of these space cathedrals. I want to go to a microgravity concert hall. Yeah. What would it look like? Can you paint the picture for me? Yeah, I think... I think maybe each person at Aurelia would have a slightly different framing of what their their space concert hall would look like. Um, I think mine, I think about it from a combination of beauty and multifunctional space. So I'd like the space to be basically have huge shutters um, and these shutters would open to reveal like the, the kind of horizon of Earth and the stars beyond and maybe the moon beyond that. So you'd have this like beautiful space view of maybe like a, a 270 degree view of that. Um, and then you'd have maybe your, your musician, um, or your actors suspended in the middle somehow, right? Yeah. Um, maybe there's like some netting or wiring that they can use to, to move around. So they're not just like stuck floating. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah. then they have, you know, they have also outfits that are like, what is a space age, you know, I don't know, think of what is your favorite play, right? Think of a Hamlet, right? And you have a space age Hamlet. And so what is, what is he wearing in his all black funeral attire, right? Is it, you know? It's not going to look like the same sort of Hamlet that was put on in the Globe Theater in 16, whatever. Um, so I think there's a lot of room to, to play with everything like that. And then you maybe have these weird natural elements that are adding to the ambiance, like you have a sunrise and sunset every 90 minutes. And so you have this weird cycle <laughs> baked yeah. into the, the performance. Um, so that's kind of the way I'd like to think about those spaces and your team members disagree with this great idea no i mean there's probably some <laughs> some details that are different yeah oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah but largely the vision is the same around these concert halls yeah yeah we all like to imagine what that would look like and kind of have these grand visions for that i think it sounds amazing let me ask you a not so fun question what would different styles of governance politics look like on space habitats do you think it would be similar to the ones we have on earth now that we're starting on a blank slate do you think we would replicate everything we have here or would it be something else entirely? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, obviously, there's a lot of current work going into space policy in general yeah. and kind of who governs what, um, whether it's materials or crafts in space. Um, I think that's something that needs a lot of thought going forward, especially when you have multinational crews, when you have um, different competing interests. Um, I think in general... There's right now there's an interesting hierarchy on a really fundamental level between mission control and the ground crew and the current crew on a space station. Um, and that's basically because the, the ground control tells the crew what to do in every waking hour. And I think as we move forward 50 years in the future, that's already started to lessen a lot um, in modern times compared to the Apollo era. And so we're going to see that continue to lessen kind of this sort of micromanagement approach is going to hopefully ease off a bit because we're letting people become more self-sufficient in space. Um, that's also just beneficial to the crew. They feel like they're more in control of their lives. Um, and as we have, you know, spaceflight participants come up and people who are tourists potentially, they're not really part of the crew. And so on this really ground level, we need to start thinking about how do those tourists really interact with people who might be career astronauts or scientists who are up there? Who, what is the, the kind of chain of command? I think it'll look a lot more like a research vessel or a ship when you still have some people who might hop on to like go to Antarctica and, and visit. Um, they still need to listen to the commander or the captain. Um, so there's a bit of that because, you know, space is still like 
the existential void of space is still a dangerous place to be, right? Yeah. Um, and so when emergencies happen, you need to have a chain of command just to be like, who are you listening to? Who do you defer to? Um, because when stuff hits the fan, like it really does matter. Um, but we'll see that, I think, play out in terms of, we've been using Antarctica and science missions as a model for so long. I think it'll kind of be similar in that way. An established hierarchy and there'll be like a captain of the ship. Right, yeah, but the captain's not going to micromanage what the tourists are doing at any given time. It's really just, for, you know, for emergencies, that's the hierarchy. But then the crew, people who are doing science and maintenance, will really be in the more strict command. Um, so that's kind of the ground level, I think, I'd imagine. In terms of governments, you know, there's a lot of people thinking about would a Mars settlement be able to pick its own government? Yeah. Um, Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars trilogy, like, deals with that a lot <laughs> and does a lot of competing interests of people who think, should we just leave all of Earth's governing ideas behind and just start fresh and think of something new? Or should we, you know, allow different factions and groups to, you know, pick their uh, government of choice, right, and style of choice? Um, so I think the jury is kind of out on that. Yeah, while you were talking about this, I also thought about space crime. I don't know if that's already happened, but like, in the FDB, that'll be the first murder in space, so right. the first pickpocket. How would you solve that? Yeah, I think I'm going to get this wrong. I knew this at one point. Um, I forgot which treaty it was, but there's there's currently regulation or law that I, I believe it is the default. Someone's going to definitely call me out on this. I think the default is that whoever committed the crime, you follow the laws of the country they're from. Oh. Um, and there might be some nuance in whatever craft you're in, whatever ownership that craft has. Um, and so there, there has been space crime. Um, an astronaut... Um, and I think it's Anne, it's Anne McLean, I think. It was a very nuanced crime where she basically tried to access the bank account of her ex to make sure that there were funds for her children. Like, it was a joint account, but it was like, there was a whole messiness of um, fraud basically trying to, like, access a bank account for space, and it was a whole thing. Um, she did not <laughs> intend, obviously, to, to commit a crime. It was just sort of like a, a messy account to log in situation from a foreign location in this case it was outer space um so that crime was dealt with you know in the u.s under u.s jurisdiction and laws um so interesting this is good trivia for like a space theme trivia night yeah or maybe you got it wrong and then people are going to be cursing you yeah. okay <laughs> imagine on the space after there's obviously people living now and the first kids are born in space let's talk about the identity crisis that i'm sure is going to come with this um, already I personally faced it like a third generation kid, a parents are from a certain country. I grew up in a different country and you have that disconnect. I cannot imagine what that would look like if it's, we're not talking countries or continents, now we talk about planets. Right. Do you think it's possible for the kids who are born in space with parents of earth origin to feel a sense of detachment, isolation, disconnected from the world? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Um, there's obviously all of the, the bio questions of, you know, what happens to a child that was, you know, carried into term in space and then born in space with no gravity. You have, there's a ton of like health questions there that we don't know the answer to. Um, and so I'm not going to touch those because I'm not, I'm not like a, um, a biologist or a doctor. Um, but I think from a like identity standpoint, that's an interesting question. Um, I do wonder if it's almost more akin to like, children who are born on military bases or like expat communities where you're sort of raised in this like artificial approximation of a culture. Um, so maybe you're like at an embassy somewhere, but you're never really like, obviously space is different because it's not like a foreign culture so much as just like alien location. Yep. <laughs> um, so maybe you're kind of, you, you know, these references to whatever it be like American culture or whatever culture, um, you know, your family is from in space I means it's like but you're not actually growing up in your parents home country so if you know they're from japan you've never actually been to tokyo but you know all these like foods approximated through space food version of that thing um and so i'd imagine it would be a lot of being like a yeah like a second gen or third gen like maybe a kid who kind of has this like this almost like secondary identity um i think about that a lot a lot with like um I'm, I'm Canadian and of Ukrainian descent. And so there's a big Ukrainian Canadian population. Um, but when that kind of thing happens, you end up with this like almost like tertiary culture that sprouts up in these places yeah. where things like myths diverge, like foods diverge, culture diverges. 
So suddenly you have like, well, that's like the real Ukrainian thing, but then you have like the Ukrainian Canadian thing that's like a little bit different and yeah. it's like the like the Shein version or like the like off brand version of um, pierogi or whatever it is, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And then over time, that might mutate into like its own its own culture, right? You, right. Exactly. Yeah. You've mentioned the different types of art and cult forms of art and culture that space have that could have. It wouldn't be hard to imagine they start inventing their own language yeah. and then. Yeah three, four generations down, people are just of space origin and then there's a completely different world or different country altogether, right? Right. You see it in like sci-fi, right? You see people who are like spacers, right? And like, you get this language pop up, like, oh, that person's a Terran, they're from Earth. You know, it's, there's a divide there, right? And so I think there's already language, like a language there that people, that you know, smart science fiction writers have thought about in terms of kind of slang and, and word choice that people like that would maybe invent and use. Would there be problems of like social status as well? Like the earthlings versus the space habitat I think, things? I think that depends on who we let <laughs> be the primary people in space, right? Um, yeah. yeah. All tough questions. I am putting you on the spot. Let me ask you another question towards building this future. What about love? How would we connect with people on space habitats, um, form relationships, fall in love, express love? Would that change on a space habitat? Um, I think, I mean, yeah, I think so. It's a confined environment. I think, <laughs> um, you know, we had a saying, I think people who are in confined environments or limited dating pools often have like, you know, the, the goggles that come on where suddenly, I don't know if you've heard this, but like my high school was small. It was like 400 people. Okay. And so we used to call it like Blair goggles is like, you think this person is more attractive than they are because your, your dating pool is a lot smaller than it maybe would otherwise be. <laughs> um, and I think when that's limited to 20 people, 50 people on a, space station, depending on what size we, we reach. Um, yeah, you're going to have a limited pool. Um, I think a big thing now is like connecting with loved ones back home also. Um, cause it's almost treated like an overseas deployment. Um, but you're also calling, you know, you're on so universal standard time. You're on like a weird time zone that probably no one else in your family is on. Um, and I know some astronauts have talked about calling their kids and it's like, you want to talk to your children about your day, but your day is like a laundry list of um, lab tasks and maintenance yeah. tasks. And it like, it's hard to try to like, well, what did you do today? And it's like, well, I fixed a machine for six hours, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Or it's like the coolest thing you've ever seen. And you saw like this amazing thing from space, but you're trying to capture these like just banal, boring moments in these like insanely life-defining inspirational moments over the phone or the video chat with your children. And it's hard to kind of um, put it all into words, I think. You sent me on this tangent. Do you think, so there's, there's two ways you can take with uh, things that really move you or these moments of profoundness. One is you get numb to it, becomes like white noise. I guess if you're constantly staring at the universe, I don't know if I might just get, stop noticing it. It so happens like mm -hmm. it's if you, if you live close to the, the Empire State Building, there comes a point where it's just, it's just in the background, right? Yeah. Or there's the other option of where you might just get so lost in the existential questions and the isolation and just thoughts about the universe that you might not get anything done. Do you have a hunch around what you might do if you were one of these habitats? Which one would it be? Or something else entirely? Yeah, this isn't obviously the same level of maybe awe-inspiring thing, but I, I did my PhD in, in, in Boulder, Colorado. Yep. Um, and Boulder's an incredible place. Um, it's located kind of in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, and we have like the Flatiron Mountains right there, which are these sort of weird rock formations that got shoved up tectonically um, and look like flat irons, like they're kind of a line of rock faces. And I would spend a lot of time like running. I do a lot of trail running and hiking in that area. And it never got old. Like every time I summited a peak there, every time I went, you know, farther into the mountains and summited mountains down there, it never yeah. was like just another, like, yeah. just another beautiful day in Colorado. It was like, <laughs> no, there's very much yeah. a, a feeling of like, this is, I'm so lucky to be here. This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Um, it was like a running joke with my friends that I, my, my photo roll is just like the same photo from my trail runs like over and over again. And it just never gets old. <laughs> and so I think, I think I have a high tolerance for repeating that kind of like pure inspirational uh, experience. <laughs> okay. I put the year for this thought experiment as 2075. Do you think it can be sooner? 
I think, yeah, I think 2075 is a, a good one because we're about 50 years out from, you know, the first people in space, a little more at this point. Um, so 50 years, you know, what else could change in that time? In some ways, a lot has changed. In some ways, shockingly little has changed. Yeah. Um, Aurelia likes to do a lot of thinking in kind of the midterm. So not the, you know, the next space station that maybe Blue Origin or Sierra Space is working on, but what is like the second or third iteration down the road. So when we start to kind of move away from these like axial sort of cylinder based designs towards something that's built differently, that's taking advantage of, um, you know, self-assembly of um, new materials of different autonomy. And as we increase the access to space, I think there's just going to be unknowns that, you know, we, I, I don't even capture in, you know, in this conversation where it's different people are flying. Maybe we have a sports league in space. And so yeah. um, I think just as, you know, as we've seen costs to actually launch and get to space go down and now with Starship having, you know, amazing flights um, and doing a lot of really good tests, like when that continues to drop and access increases, I think the, you know, the world is, you know, everyone's oyster. It's going to change depending on who we start sending to space. But perfect segue to start talking about space habitats. But I'm going to start to squeeze in one yeah. more question, a well, personal question. Would you want to live on these space habitats? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I would. I would for sure live in a space habitat permanently. I don't think I would want to live permanently. Um, and I think I, maybe I've thought too long about this. I think the more I think about space, and the more I hear about people talk about what it's like to be in space. The point is to get up there and you start seeing, it, it gives you an appreciation for the planet we live on. Um, I'm someone who like loves the outdoors. I love, I love earth. Like I love everything about this planet. Um, and so I would think I would miss that a lot. Um, living in a kind of more confined environment, despite how amazing that would be to be in space and to experience that. Um, I think for the majority of my life, I'd like to, to live here on the planet. Okay. Point taken. Okay, let's start talking about the space habitats. Firstly, thank you so much for building that picture of that future in space. Let's start talking about some of the projects and engineering technology that can hopefully get us to that vision. First, let's start with the problem statement. You brought it up earlier as well. What are the limitations with some of the current designs and the current technology? You brought the central cylindrical axis, the monolithic hulls. What are the problems with those? Why do we need new designs? Or what's the second generation, third generation of those designs are going to look like? Yeah, so <clears throat> a lot of the current space stations and even the ones that are coming down the pipeline are really based on this. I guess I would say it almost began with the Salyut uh, space stations that were Soviet and out through Mir um, and then, you know, the International Space Station where we have, they're technically modular. Um, but when we think about modular, we think of things that are reconfigurable or things that you can move around. And the ISS is technically modular. It was built in pieces, um, but they don't really move things around. Like once it's locked in, uh, it's pretty locked in. Um, it's built axial, axially, so um, there's a primary axis that the whole thing is based on with uh, on a truss. And then you basically have this really long hallway that's the length of a football field, right? And so um, even though you have a lot of volume, you have the volume of, you know, like a multi-bedroom house up there. Um, it's arranged in these kind of like weird, weird corridors. And so you're constantly traversing through a space where someone else is doing something uh, to get somewhere else. And the only kind of dead end spaces are the ones that are built in the perpendicular axis. Um, and I think, well, that's definitely worked so far. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we're trying to use a lot of the space up there for a lot of multipurpose activities. And so you end up filling the space. I think I'd encourage anyone to go look up photos of like a before and after of the space station. Basically, when it was first launched, it was like this beautiful, <laughs> sterile white box looking thing. <laughs> and then now you look at it and it's like there's laptops floating around. You have like Velcro everywhere and wires and, um, you know, just a bunch of different uh, <laughs> different activities happening. Um, and that's, you know, it's you're living in a lab space that's also the place where you try to relax and it's also the place where you sleep and it's also the place where you take your meals. So, um, I think what we'd want to move towards is a little bit more of a divider in functionality. Um, I think anyone who has spent a lot of time at home and working from home during COVID saw that it's really hard to do your best work and do your best relaxing and recreation all in the same place. Cause it starts to kind of blend together psychologically. Um, so seeing more separation, just giving people more space, um, and being able to take advantage 
of stowing things away and then bringing them out when you need them, um, I think is important. So one of the approaches that you've taken is building self-assembling structures. Mm -hmm. So in general, and this may be a silly question, why do we need self-assembling structures? Yeah. So self-assembly generally, not just in space, um, the, the, one of the bigger kind of benefits of it is just saving person time. Right. And so in space that manifests in like a whole, like a whole protocol, right? When you put a person out there to help build the station and to, to clarify when people build the space station, um, it was a lot of astronaut EVA time in conjunction with the, the Canada arm, which is the robotic arm. Um, the space shuttle had one. And then finally the, the space station had one. Um, so they were able to do what was called the Canadian handshake where they like passed a module out of the shuttle payload bay to the space station. And then the, the two arms were able to like pass it off and, and build it. Yeah. Um, but it took hundreds of hours of crew uh, spacewalk time. Um, and spacewalks are not, you know, trivial activities. Um, a lot of scary stuff has happened on spacewalks. Um, and they take a long time. They take like eight hours. And so, you know, when you're paying for someone to be up there to do research and they need to go instead do an eight hour spacewalk, um, you lose their whole day. And then they also need to do the pre-breathing where they're trying to get suited up. And so it's like, it's a really long day for the astronauts. Um, and a, li a very limited number of them are trained to do EVAs. Okay, what's pre-breathing? Uh, so you, the space station itself is kept at, at one atmosphere. So roughly the same same pressure, atmospheric composition as we're breathing right now at sea level. Um, you can't really keep spacesuits at that pressure because it's like the Michelin man. You wouldn't be able to, to move the joints if it was at a full atmosphere of pressure. So they keep it at a lower pressure. Um, and to avoid giving the astronauts the bends when they start breathing that lower pressure atmosphere, um, they have to pre-breathe and slowly step down the pressure. Um, it's kind of like a scuba diving uh, calculus. Um, so that's kind of a, an additional consideration is that they have to pre-breathe for a couple hours. Gotcha. Yeah. Sorry, I distracted you. So you're talking no, about the no, space, yeah. spacewalks. Yeah. Yeah. So spacewalks is in space that makes a lot of sense to save person time by doing that. And so yeah. instead of, you know, spending 80 hours trying to build 500 cubic meters of space, um, if you had a self-assembling situation, you could do that in, you know, eight hours of self-assembly time um, instead of doing dozens and dozens of, of crew EVAs. Um, additionally, you also, you, you, you can pack things smaller if they assemble in space instead of having to be assembled on earth. Um, so there's just a, a pure efficiency, um, argument to be made there. Um, on earth self assemblies is huge for basically any robotic, um, activities. So dangerous environments, you know, um, environments that might be, um, post disaster. Maybe you're trying to build shelters, you're trying to build, um, rafts, or I think a lot about, um, like storm walls. So trying to, protect coastal cities from, from big storm swells. Um, those could be self-assembled in a way that you just can't get divers in trying to build that sort of like temporary, um, temporary structural relief there. Um, there's a lot of, uh, like disaster and, and exploration. So there would be like a trickle down effect of you building these self-assembling structures for space, but they could actually be very useful on earth itself. Potentially. Yeah. I mean, self-assembly looks different in microgravity than maybe on earth, but it's still the same sort of application of like, what can we do if these structures can build themselves without people in a very limited time window? Very cool. Let's also cover some of the historical ideas in a study titled a methodology for the systematic review of space architecture concepts. You explore the entire historical database all the way from Mercury, Vostok, Herman Potoshnik's work, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, all the way to Bernalspheres, O'Neill Cylinders, the Hilton Hotel on Space yeah. Station 5 in 2001 Space Odyssey. What are some of the most powerful ideas that have stood out to you? And maybe it doesn't have to be the entire idea that has stood the test of time. Maybe you could just pick and choose certain aspects. We spoke about the engineering design, maybe even beauty. Are there any particular ideas that really stand out to you or certain aspects of them that you think you can use and can implement in the future? Yeah. I think the, the act of making that study itself, um, and to, to clarify, this is an ongoing database that we're just like yeah. constantly adding to of yeah. space architecture concepts. Mm -hmm. um, so people can like head to our website and if you look at this database and you're like, oh, this thing I know about isn't there, you can submit a concept and we'll yeah. add it. Um, but for us, it's a good exercise in figuring out what's been done before. Because mm -hmm. um, even folks at ASA that we collaborate with, you know, we saw, we presented this work and they were like, thank you for doing this. Like, there's just stuff we didn't even know NASA did from the decades and decades of work because it's buried in like some basement or website, like super deep Xeroxed file that's like looks gnarly. Um, in terms of specific concepts, notable ones that I think a lot about are 
Um, we just love rings. Like we, we just like, you know, from Von Braun's like artificial gravity spinning donut all the way up through Tor the Stanford Taurus and concepts of spinning these large rings. I think that's really fascinating. And living in a ring environment would be, you know, like Neil Stevenson plays a lot with this and different yeah. science fiction authors. Um, it's just a really cool concept um, all the way up through to me, like the O'Neill cylinder is like the like kind of crowning, like uh, ambition idea of this like, huge like city state sized like uh environment where you have um farmland and you have cities and you have this like you know whole settlement in space and that whole summer study where a lot of those concepts came from was like a an undertaking by nasa and some collaborators in the 70s um, and a lot of really good concepts came out of that summer study they just got a bunch of people who are experts in that and like let them dream for a summer um and see what they could come up with about the best way to scale up life in space. So we've covered the um, we covered the historical database. Let's talk about some of the projects that you're working on now. Let's talk about the tessellated electromagnetic space structures for the exploration of reconfigurable adaptive environments. Rolls off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the Tesseray project. What is the Tesseray project? Yeah. So Tesseray, like every good um, space acronym, it really <laughs> it has a lot of moving parts. Um, it actually spun out of our founder, Ariel Ekblah's PhD thesis at MIT. Um, and Ariel's great because she takes inspiration from so many different fields. And so Tesseray really came out of a lot of the work that Buckminster Fuller did with um, buckyballs yeah. and these ideas from everything from like viral capsids to protein folding to just like tessellating patterns in nature and taking these kind of disparate ideas and bringing them together in a structural architectural concept and then applying that to space. Um, and so Tesseray is a self-assembling um, structural concept applied to space habitats. Um, and so it's based on a truncated icosahedron, which also rolls off the tongue, <laughs> which is um, a 32 tile solid based on, um, I believe, oh God, why am I blanking on the number of tiles of each shape? It's basically made of pentagons and hexagons. Um, and Tesseray, the idea behind it is that you could launch these tiles that were packed kind of like Ikea furniture, like in a flat pack stack, like a Pringles can. Um, and then they would get to space and they would use semi-permanent electromagnets to self-assemble because in space, you know, you don't have a lot of the, you're not fighting gravity. Um, you can do a lot more with magnets than you can on earth. Um, and so these tiles would self-assemble and close into a structural shell that you could then populate and pressurize and make into a habitat. Um, and so a lot of the work under the Aurelia umbrella right now falls um, into kind of proving and designing out tesserae across scales. Um, so we have multiple generations now of flight hardware of scaled down um, mini tesserae hardware that have flown uh, twice to the International Space Station um, the Gen 4 tiles are hopefully going to fly again pretty soon to the International Space Station. Um, and we just flew those little tiles on um, a zero-G flight in February. Um, and by scale, I mean, they are quite small. Like there may be the Gen 4 tiles are probably the size of my hand stretched out. Um, and we fly them during these zero-G flights and they, we watch their behavior, um, how they bond, how they uh, find each other and um, eventually form large structures and shapes in that truncated icosahedron shape. Um, and then kind of on the other, the full, the full opposite side of the spectrum, um, some of the work that I'm leading right now is the Tesserae case study. And so what we're doing is we're doing, um, like the engineering work behind designing a full scale Tesserae habitat, um, imagined as a four crew biotechnology research station. Um, and so that looks like, what are the solar panels look like on that thing? You know, what do the radiators look like? How much heat does it have to reject? How much power does it need to generate? What does the lab space look like? How many quarters are there? Where do the quarters look, uh, what do they look like? Um, and then designing it really to be this sort of midterm functional habitat that's like not quite like orbital reef near term, but the next thing um, as a space to live and work in space. I want to probe into every single thing that you mentioned. I'm going to start with the shape and the composition. So you mentioned there, pentagons, hexagons. Why did you choose that shape? And what are they made of? What materials did you choose and why? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to 
be speaking for Ariel at this point. Um, and so the, the, the Buckminster Fuller kind of Bucky ball shape, um, the, the short answer is that it's almost a sphere. <laughs> and so the idea behind a sphere is that uh, you have a maximum volume to surface area ratio. Yeah. And so for an amount of mass, you get a very high volume. Uh, and volume for you know, uh, keeping a crew alive and healthy and happy in space, um, they want a certain, you know, you, you want to provide them with enough space to, to, to grow and flourish and like not be on top of each other all the time. Um, I like to compare it like if you're going to be stuck inside with you know, five or six of your closest friends for six months, do you want to be in a tent or do you want to be in like a four bedroom house? And you probably want to be in a, in a larger space. Yep. Um, and Buckminster Fuller and some of those, you know, ideas behind the buckyball um, was a very like inspiring concept for terrestrial architecture. And again, drawing on aspects of nature and um, just like the beauty of sort of these, these shapes that all match up on their sides and come together. Um, so it also worked really well with magnets. It turns out you can work well, you can place magnets along the faces of these pentagons and hexagons in a way where the fields line up for each other to actually bond and, and uh, um, generate, you know, a shape together. So We spoke a lot about beauty earlier. Can you comment on the beauty that's inherent in the Tesserae project? And how do you go about conceptualizing these designs that you think might appear beautiful? Like, how do you, how do you brainstorm what impact that beauty might have as you're thinking about this project? That's a really good question. Um, I think for me that the tile-based work, um, it reminds me a lot more of like fractals and just in general has more visual interest than like a cylinder would. Um, and so you get this like natural variation between the pentagons and hexagons where one's slightly smaller than the other. And so you can use one for a window, but then the other for your galley space. And so you have these like natural kind of discrepancies of the way you're artificially constraining your design space, which is, I think, good. I think coming from an aerospace design background, you you want constraints because it gives you a place to start working. Um, otherwise your space is too big and you don't know where to start. Yeah. Um, and I think with, you know, these pentagons and hexagons, you get these really cool options for where the lights are and where the windows are. And you get these like just beautiful angles that are, I think with you, if things are too uniform and too square, you end up with kind of a, a, a visual lack of interest where it's like a little bit too brutalist or sad or boring. And I think it's like the right balance between things are, things are organized, but they're um, not just like a blank void. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, such interesting questions that you're asking. W what about the self-assembling algorithm? I believe you use a stochastic self-assembling algorithm. Can you, Comment a bit more on that. How do you go about putting that logic in place? How do these tiles come together and assemble into these beautiful shapes and structures that we spoke about? Yeah, so I can't give too many details on this because some of it's, <laughs> yeah, some of it's uh, in-house uh, proprietary. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, the, the short answer is you use a lot of sensor work. Um, so it's quasi-stochastic because there's a bit, of, a bit of knowledge of where the tiles are, of what they're bonding to. Um, to make sure that it's, like I said, like the right, you don't want necessarily like these two tiles to bond, you want these other tiles to bond. Sure. And so there's a decision-making process on each one where it checks out to make sure this is a good bond and it's the right bond. Mm -hmm. um, and so those will confirm the bond um, and then the magnets will bond and stop. Um, and obviously when you, if we're using this for a habitat scale structure, you can't rely on just magnets once it's pressurized because it's hard to maintain all that pressure. And so um, a lot of our design work now is on things like um, actuated bolts, latches, gasketing, um, all of the components that would really make this a, a contained vessel um, once it is self-assembled and all that gets baked into each of those tiles. What would those contained vessels be used for? What are the type of habitats that you can create? Yeah, I mean, the idea is anything. Um, part of the work that we're turning towards too is what what does what do these structures look like with the their kind of like growth paradigm um so if you have you know one one tesserae but maybe there's a year or two where there's a ton more science that needs to happen and so you need to have more space and more lap space um in low earth orbit and so suddenly you have three or four or five tesserae's all linked up together like a protein molecule um what's the best way to arrange that where do you put the central uh, gathering space, where do you put the lab space? So right now we're, we're focusing both on kind of in a single tesserae shell, 
how do you design a design or uh, divide up that space for people to live? But then yeah. if you expand it to be multiple of these kind of molecules together, um, can you design the space differently? So it's, you know, one distributed system rather than a bunch of contained systems. Are you generating artificial gravity in these structures? In Tesserae, we, I guess you theoretically could, it's probably not the best suited for it. Okay. Um, so we're not looking at artificial gravity as applied to Tesserae, but we are looking at it for other habitat concepts that we're working on. Um, sort of looking at, you know, the ring obviously is this idea that people keep returning to. Yeah. The other options is kind of a, um, almost like a dumbbell shape people often like. Um, but are there other ways to look at artificial gravity? Could you use like a nautilus shell shape um, where you have variable gravity spiraling in words? And so not just a ring and a set gravity, but different levels. So you could still have a lot of access to maybe a lunar gravity simulator or a microgravity simulator. How do you generate artificial gravity? Uh, you spin something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the short answer is that you, you, um, you spin something around at the right right frequency at the right uh, distance away from a center point um, so that the centripetal force acts mm -hmm. as a gravitational force to kind of artificially put your free feet towards the outer part. Um, and then you can theoretically also use it as a countermeasure for a lot of the adverse effects of being in microgravity. So it helps to have that gravity pull to uh, help your bones, your muscles, your, your um, cardiovascular fitness. Have you experienced zero gravity? I have, yeah. So I flew on that February flight. Yeah, what was that house. feeling like? Uh, so it was really cool. It was awesome. Um, it was, I think, shockingly similar to what it's like to be neutrally buoyant. If anyone's a scuba diver, it's it's very similar to that, um, you know, minus the, the water resistance around you. Um, so it was a surprise by how familiar that felt. Um, yeah. And then, of course, they they have this whole talk they give you where they're like don't kick you know you can't swim you're yeah. just gonna be floating you're not actually like swimming and I was like yeah who would who would ever try to do that and then, <laughs> as soon as I started floating I was like, like starting to swim of. around um yeah. so there's a bit of a learning curve with like how do how much force do I use to like push off and like uh navigate the inside of this aircraft that you're in um yeah. and was not, it profound in any way I think it was in terms of how you think about the space and how suddenly this like aircraft fuselage um, looked different to me because I could stand on the ceiling, right? Or I could um, Spider-Man myself onto the wall. And so just trying to put myself in the mindset of like, how would I use the space if I didn't have like an up-down orientation? Um, I think that's probably the, the biggest takeaway. Very cool. Have you watched the movie Ad Astra? I have not, no. Yeah. Uh, you have a great movie waiting for you. In that movie, and I'm going to give you a small spoiler, Brad Pitt says the following words. The zero gravity and extended duration of the journey is affecting me both physically and mentally. I'm alone. Something I always believed I preferred, but I confess it is wearing on me. Mm. I'm alone. I'm alone. You have explored the psychological effects of living on space habitats, the isolation and anxiety that comes with it, boredom as well. How do you start conceptualizing ideas for navigating those obstacles when you think of the Tesserae project? Is that something you're giving a lot of weight to? Yeah, so for Tesserae, we haven't, we've thought a little bit about it for deep space applications, um, but we're mostly focused on low Earth orbit right now, which is generally lesser, like six month duration is like pretty standard. Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of thinking about long duration space flight for, um, again, for my, my graduate work. Um, and it's a really tricky balance between, like I mentioned before, wanting to um, utilize crew time because they're so valuable. Like having the crew in, in space is expensive. It's hard to get people up there, but also not wanting them to be overburdened, which has happened a lot where crew doesn't have, they don't have enough free time. They have too much work to do. Um, and I think it's a question of kind of like what type of work is it? Because a crew can be so busy doing maintenance, but at that point they just feel like they're like a wrench listening to mission control. Yeah. Um, whereas there's work that crew is, is, has expressed that they really enjoy doing. And that work is often work that has meaning back home, whether it's um, like I mentioned before, like cancer research or really feeling like you're doing research that is helping people back on earth um, versus just kind of like, you know, doing some of the more chore-like work up there. And so I think it's important to, to make sure when you design a mission 
to make sure that you're giving the crew f- like fulfillment that way. It's like Maslow's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where you sure. have that top of the pyramid is yeah. equally as important when you get, reach these long durations in space. Um, it isn't just about keeping the people alive and healthy anymore. You want to make sure that they're you know productive, but really that they're happy um, because it's increasingly important the longer you go. Would that solve for loneliness? <sighs> loneliness is hard because there's like a, there's a real physical isolation. Um, and I know people talk a lot about using like VR and <laughs> things like that, but I, I can't help shake the feeling that when you take off the VR headset and you just stare at the inside of your space habitat, that you're going to be even, even <laughs> it's like heart, yeah, it's like heartbreaking. <laughs> um, so I think there's, you need a certain type of person to do those long duration space flights, especially as we look towards, you know, Mars where the mission length could be, you know, two years. And there's just kind of a level of sacrifice that comes with that. I think the way that, you know, long expeditions on by sea would have been, you know, for people in the age of exploration. Right. Um, and so I think there's a lot of romanticizing of it, but I think there's like that, that movie obviously like touches on the real, real sacrifice that people like that would have to make. I also want to get thoughts on just the life of an engineer at university of Colorado Boulder, Professor David Klaus gave you the nickname Buzzkill, which is a nickname that was adopted by the astronaut Gary Riesman. And you started hoping, I hope this doesn't stick. I wanted to ask you about this problem, I guess, this life of an engineer where you have to walk this fine line between really imaginative, creative ideas, but you have to filter them through the lens of feasibility and what's possible, what's pragmatic, right? What's practical. Yeah. Do you find that tough? Is there a part of you just wishes that you could just go on these different explorations of romantic ideas and these idealistic scenarios, but you know for a fact the engineer within you will always shoot it down? Yeah, that's okay. That's first of all, it's a good question. You've done your <laughs> research. Um, because it was actually Garrett who gave me that that nickname. Okay. Um, based on the role my PhD was playing in kind of our big NASA project, uh, which is <laughs> yeah, was, I had to I had to be the buzzkill, which is no one wants to be the buzzkill. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. In terms of, so the question is like about balancing idealism with engineering practicality, yep. right? I think I'm a, I'm an optimist, like I'm an idealist at heart. Um, and I don't think those two things need to be mutually exclusive. And I think particularly aerospace engineering is a discipline where it brings a lot of idealists, right? You have people who, you know, it's like the JPL model is the Jet Propulsion Lab at NASA is a dare mighty things, right? And those guys are amazingly crazy, right? They're like, you know, what if we use these giant airbags yeah. to throw a rover at Mars? Or like, <laughs> what if we yeah. put a helicopter on Mars and then they do it? Um, and so I think there's, you can you can have kind of this like daring as an engineer to think big. Because even if you miss and you make compromises to make the physics work out um, and you still make something happen, I think there's, there's wonder in that, right? Um, and so to me, it's like a, it's a, a balance of letting your idealism drive you to what you want to do and then seeing, okay, then how do we actually make that happen? And the how is the engineering. You're the director of engineering at Aurelia, which stands for Chrysalis, the metamorphosis of humans into the space faring civilization. Ariel Akplau, the founder and CEO, in a previous interview, she had once mentioned that from the outside looking in, it would seem like space exploration has slowed down ever since the moon landing. But in reality, it's just catching up. That event was so far ahead of its time that now we've reached a stage where technology and design has finally caught up with that. You spoke about this earlier as well, where you said shockingly little has changed, or it would seem like that shockingly little has changed in the moon landing. Do you think that the moon landing was such a singular event, was so far ahead of its time that we needed all this time to catch up? Or do you think it happened at the right time and we have lost decades of progress? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... I don't think there's a right wrong a right time and a wrong time. I think it happened at the time it did for a lot of geopolitical reasons. Um, and I think there was a lot of, you know, I think I think a lot about Star Trek because I'm um, a huge Trekkie. And <laughs> there's a lot of undercurrent in that show about, like, humanity basically had to get its act together before we could go to space and kind of pitch a united front about who we were yeah. before we could extend ourselves to other cultures and, and, um, you know, societies in space. And so I think there's a level of like, yeah, Apollo was happening during a time that was like culturally just incredibly tumultuous, right? You had the civil rights movement, 
Um, like I wouldn't have been able to open a bank account during the Apollo era as a woman, which is bananas. Um, yeah. And so <laughs> there's parts of that that are like, we did what we could with this sort of like just purely like sledgehammer of engineering at the time, you know, Apollo computing was incredible. I would highly recommend if you're, you know, interested in the, the engineering side of Apollo to read the book, digital Apollo, because it talks about the flight computer um, and all of the work that had to go into getting humans to the moon when like that whole spacecraft had the processing power of less than my iPhone. Right. Yeah. Um, so that itself was incredible. And I think we've made space exploration, you know, it's evolved. It's evolved who we send. I think, you know, I was a shuttle kid. Like I grew up watching the space shuttle launch and land and I was blown away that this thing could look like an aircraft and land like an aircraft and shuttle like really opened the door to who we started to fly in space. It wasn't just test pilots. It was scientists and engineers. It was teachers. It was, you know, everyone. Um, and obviously there's still a little bit of like ivory towerness all around that because you need to be someone who's highly qualified by traditional metrics. And I hope that continues to change in the future of who we get to send to space. Um, yeah. But in terms of progress, I think, I think it hasn't, I think space flight in general, I don't know how to say this. Like, I feel like it hasn't necessarily stalled. I think we are catching up in a lot of ways, but I think there are so many competing things for people's attention now that even when we make really big wins, people don't necessarily treat it like the big win it is, right? Um, and so, you know, they get a little bit lost in the sauce of like, this space company is owned by this person and the space company is owned by that person. And they're not yeah. looking at the actual really cool work the engineers are doing. Um, or they see a rocket explode on TV and they think that's a failure when Apollo went through so many different rockets before we got the rockets to actually work. Um, and so I think there's just sort of a, a PR, a PR issue that we might need to change, but yeah, I don't know. Let's talk about that PR issue. Let's you, you took us down this road again. Let's talk about these companies that have reignited this interest in space exploration. Let's talk about SpaceX, Blue Origin. They're locked in this friendly battle that is now commonly referred to as Space Race 2.0. Mm -hmm. What is your thought on this commercialization of space exploration, these private companies coming in? Do you think it's a positive for the industry? Is there any negatives involved in it? What are your general thoughts? Yeah, I think, I think it's ultimately a positive. Um, I think... The commercialization of space. So for, for context, I was also a Matthew Isakowitz fellow. Um, the Matthew Isakowitz Fellowship is a really incredible program. That's the whole goal is to get people interested in commercial space flight. Um, and I think without commercial space flight, we wouldn't have, you know, had the space station around as long as we have. Because, you know, SpaceX with uh, Cargo Dragon and now Crew Dragon has allowed us to continue resupplying the space station and getting crew up to the space station. Um, and... I think what happened is it's moved from just kind of being a government supported contract the way that, you know, shuttle was built by commercial companies and then operated by NASA. But now you have this sort of like one step forward or further where commercial companies are really supporting themselves in this industry. And there's like a space for space sort of idea happening. Um, and I think it has definitely reignited the way engineering students engage with the industry because your options are so much more varied now. Um, even when I was going to school, it was like, it felt like your options were just like NASA or Boeing or, you know, Lockheed Martin and like maybe SpaceX if you like wanted to work 80 hours a week and yeah. <laughs> drive yourself into the ground because they were just coming up. Um, but now you have so many more options and there's more room for people to, to get into space that way, uh, which I think is really important. You spoke about the people leading these companies, these little known names, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, there's a lot of comment about uh, these companies being run on the cult of personality of these two individuals. Mm -hmm. What do you think of them? Are they the right people? Do they have the right motivations? Are they the right ushers of this new space age? That's a hard question. Um, yeah, I mean, like, you know, I can say what I want about each of them yeah. based on their own personal values. But the the bottom line is like both of their companies are still doing work, right? Good work. Um, SpaceX may be more, <laughs> more successfully so in the public eye. Um, whereas blue has a lot of like behind the scenes work on, on solar panel and lunar regolith that I think, again, they're maybe not advertising as well as they should, but they're still winning contracts. Um, and SpaceX is doing incredible work. 
And it takes a village, right? It takes the whole village, not just the, the face of those companies. Would I like those companies to have maybe like slightly more, less like inflammatory heads? Like probably, right? <laughs> but I think like the reality is that people get sucked into cult of personality. And that's just like how we operate in our environment now. Um, yeah. And I would like it to not be, I'd like it to be more focused on like, the really good work the engineers are doing. Like, I don't think anyone in the public could name the NASA administrator, but people do know about the the Mars rovers, right? Which I think is good. Whereas like, I don't think people could name, you know, this Falcon as a SpaceX rocket, but they know who Elon Musk is. So it's interesting how that kind of flopped a little bit with the commercial side um, or flip flopped, not like flopped, but. Do you think that's inevitable? Like you have to have someone that, I don't know if popular is the word, but I guess that type of a name that people start gravitating towards because you get so much interest and we can actually start making the progress that we want. No, I don't think so. I, th- I think you just need to have someone who can fundraise and someone who has <laughs> like, like someone who knows how to hire good engineers and do good work. Right. Cause eventually the work will start paying or start speaking for itself. Um, and not just like the personality. I think it's just sort of like to the public, those companies are the, the personalities, but um, in the industry, it really is like about the good work those companies do and about the engineers. Let me ask you a question I despise personally, but I have taken on this unfortunate role of playing devil's advocate today. So I have to ask you, it seems to me that every time we make significant progress in space exploration, someone comes out and says, why are we investing so many resources and wasting so much money on these, on just building rockets or these ideas in space when there are people on earth who are homeless, starving, we should be spending that money and those resources here. I personally don't like this question, but I want to hear your answer to this. What yeah. would you say to those people? So there's, there's two things I would say, and I think it's a good question. Um, the first thing is that we're not literally like packing rockets full of money and like launching the money into space. <laughs> like the money yeah. is like going to, <laughs> the money's like going to people's jobs and livelihoods. And there's, so there's some, there's like some industries that exist in that and, and, and people who are helped by that. Um, that's my first answer. My second answer is there are worse things to spend money on, I think, because there's whole generations of people who have been inspired to enter scientific and engineering fields, not just aerospace, but biology, become doctors, become civil engineers um, because of space, right? Because they watched the Apollo landings or because they saw the space shuttle launch and take off because they saw a Falcon rocket land um, or the Curiosity rover land. Um, And I think that's like, I, I really think that's powerful. Like, I think that's something that when you have, you see what humankind can do when a bunch of them get together and have the dumb idea to like put a robot on another planet, like that's awesome, right? Like you see, they can do that and it it works and we learn a lot about the world around us. Um, And a lot of that work has informed what we do on earth, right? There's, there's work medically for astronauts that has uh, applications to real people on earth. There's um, conditions that space travel exacerbates like um, issues with your, your sight and your eye lenses um, osteoporosis is basically a guarantee for astronauts at certain points. And then that reverses as they come back. Um, and so there's real life conditions that we're learning more and more about and developing treatments for, um, because of space travel. And so it feels a little bit far because it's so basic research. It's such a fundamental science. We're learning about rocks on Mars. We're learning about the bones and when the way molecules behave in zero G. Um, but eventually that science trickles down and eventually that science becomes, therapeutics. It becomes new medical devices. Um, it becomes learning about the way our rivers change and evolve over time in the face of climate change. And so, um, yeah, I think science is beneficial ultimately. Thank you. I'm going to cut this clip on every time someone leaves a comment on Twitter. I'm just going to paste this. (laughs) There's so many positive externalities of space exploration and we'll only compound over time. Fantastic. Before we start moving into our closing questions, I would love it if you can interpret what masterpiece you've built with the Lego and what, what nonsense do you think I've built? Oh man. Uh, well, yours is definitely much more um, like impressively complex than mine. I think I just kind of found some fun symmetrical shapes to make a forklift arch, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, Well, there's beauty in the simplicity. I mean, yeah. clearly this is not, I, I love the eyeballs on that. It makes me, it, <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel like a very like Lovecraftian, a little bit scary uh, Dadaist creation. Um, what does this look like? Um, I think to me, it looks like, uh, you know, in Star Wars, when they go to cities and you have this like, like canyons full of, uh, buildings and you have little cruisers like flying around. Um, it feels like that, but then kind of big brother E with the, uh, the eyeballs on top. (laughs) 
the hand of the artist yeah <laughs> it's right there amazing okay let's move into some of our closing questions what are some books movies role models that have strongly influenced you in your life yeah um i'll start with the role models um there's certain astronauts that i like love to like cheer on follow um i think that are the forces of good in the world um like Garrett Reisman, obviously was one of them who I worked with on the, the, my PhD uh, yeah. distantly kind of through our project. Um, Steve Robinson is another astronaut who is also Canadian American. Um, and he's one of the nicest people. He's the PI that I worked with. Um, and he was on my, my PhD committee, literally one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life, really down to earth. Um, the boomch, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, great guy. Um, I would also say, uh, just Watkins is another great, I haven't actually met her, but she's really cool. <laughs> Um, and I honestly, like, this is really cheesy, but a lot of the faculty at CU where I did, did my PhD are, um, like incredible role models. Um, Jim Navity, David Klaus, Allie Anderson, uh, Torin Clark, like they, the bioastronautics program is small, but mighty and, um, incredibly welcoming, incredibly supportive community. Um, kind of unique, I think I hadn't really seen it in academia or in aerospace before, just how tight knit and supportive and uh, curious and multidisciplinary that group is. It's really an inspiration, I think. Yeah. Movies, books. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I read a lot and varied um, in terms of space related books. It could be any, it any, could be any, it doesn't have to be space. Yeah. Yeah. So I love like Ursula K. Le Guin. I love a lot of her work. Um, kind of weaving science fiction and political questions together. Um, Left Hand of Darkness, obviously, is great. The Word for World is Forest is another good one. And uh, The Dispossessed. Uh, if you like thinking about what would happen if you had a communist moon and a capitalist moon and someone defected from the communist moon to the capitalist moon, it's a great story. Who doesn't story. like thinking about that? It's great, yeah. It's a great <laughs> thought experiment. Um, I really like, um, and Anne Leckie, I think, is almost like the spiritual successor of Le Guin. Uh, she wrote The Ancillary Justice book and then the series from that um as well as the raven tower which is a fantasy it's an almost a retelling of hamlet from a god's perspective which is like a really interesting fantasy book um yeah i'm trying to think Susanna clark is good uh she wrote piranesi uh, which is a really really beautiful modern fantasy um it's so hard to explain what that book is about because it's just like so beautiful and, and like perfectly edited down it's like almost novella length um about someone who lives in a kind of a stone statue garden and you like learn more and more about this person about who he is and where he's from and the way he sees the world it's very interesting um catch 22 was a really formative book for me um joseph heller like just sort of this like black comedy about the horrors of war and absurdity and i like think about that book all the time i reread it every few years just to see like how the ideas evolve a little bit in my head. Um, so, yeah. Movies, I'm not going to let you go either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some good movies. Let's see. I love Arrival. I think Arrival is like my favorite space movie, which like doesn't count as a space movie, kind of. I just love the way it thinks about like the, the intricacy of learning language from, um, and obviously it's based on a, on a short story, but the short story is great too. Um, Ted Chang is not a great author. Um, but I love that movie and the way it brought an alien to life in a really like extraterrestrial way. And even the ships look so different than what we've seen. It's just like a monolithic stone almost, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's a really, really cool take on alien invasion and the way humanity struggles to put a united front forward. Um, so yeah, I'd say that. Man, I'm so bad with movies. <laughs> <laughs> I, loved, I love Studio Ghibli. Like I love everything the man Miyazaki turns out like I love uh Princess Mononoke Howl's Moving Castle um Porco Rosso is my personal favorite which is kind of a comedy that he put out um very good yeah great list you've put Arrival as your pick for the best sci-fi movie of all time oh I don't know about all time oh what's <laughs> what's the oh, best but... sci-fi and book what would be your number one for each oh that's a hard question only uh, hard questions yeah Best sci-fi movie. People have a, like capital O opinions about this too. Yeah. Um, I'm sure someone out there like thinks it's like Alien or Jurassic. I guess Jurassic Park is pretty good. Man. Best sci-fi movie. Yeah, no, you know what? I'll just, I'll commit. Arrival. I'll say Arrival. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you're double down on Arrival. Yeah, I'll double what down. What about the book? Um, 
I feel like I should then just say that the, uh, the like the, the book it's based on, Story of Your Life. Um, best sci-fi book. I feel like I'm not as well versed with, with the books as I should be. I think Dune is up there. It's definitely a really good, <laughs> really good science fiction book. Um, it kind of depends on what you're looking for, if it's like hard sci-fi or like character-based sci-fi, right? Um, but yeah. what's the one that moved you the most? Um, the one, oh wow, that's a question. I think the one that moved me the most is a total left field one, uh, which is An Unkindness of Ghosts by River Solomon. Um, sort of about a generation ship and it explores so a character, the main character who is the assistant to the kind of chief medical officer of the ship and investigating the class divide that has like uh, formed over the centuries on this ship and how we've just reinvented problems across ship levels and kind of it, it weaves through like racism and classism into this like generation ship and the lies that are kind of spreading about when the ship is going to get to its destination and when it's going to, like how it's going to function when it gets there. Um, and it is just a really beautiful, um, again, kind of novella length story. Very intriguing. It reminds me of the movie Snowpiercer. It's, it's yeah. kind of similar to Snowpiercer. Yeah. I think it is better done. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe because there's no yeah. train. <laughs> it's like, just a spaceship. Yeah. What is one of the biggest mysteries in the universe? Oh, interesting. I think to me, it's like the, are we alone question? Um, I'll be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, I like hope we aren't, I think it'd be kind of sad. Um, I like to think that there's like at least some sort of like, um, even non-intelligent life, just like vibing out there on a rock. Right. Even if it's not, if it doesn't look anything like us, it doesn't look talk or even be carbon based. It might not be. Um, but I think, it, I think the fact that there can be so many, star systems and planets like there must be something out there that's just even in primordial soup just baking <laughs> then why haven't we seen them the Fermi's paradox yeah I, i actually really like uh the uh dark forest theory i thought that was a good creepy solution to the paradox which is uh effectively if you haven't read the three body problem in that trilogy um it's that the dark forest theory is that uh you no one is broadcasting because if they do it's basically instant annihilation because of the limited resources and the kind of you know, to exist is to be aggressive and to fight over these resources. And so no one should be broadcasting because if you do, you're, you're an idiot and you're about to get annihilated. <laughs> so, yeah. Great way to set the vibe. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> When you were around 12 years old, I think you went to the Kennedy Space Center and you were that inspired by what you saw of the rocket boosters and the space shuttle that you came home and you wrote pages upon pages in your journal. You come from this self-professed, Top Gun family, your mother was a flight attendant, your grandfather was in the Royal Canadian Air Force, he was a pilot. Looking back now, knowing where you are today and where you're heading, hopefully that space habitat in 2075, what advice would you want to give to 12-year-old Anika and other kids like her? Oh, that's a good question. I'd say don't... Don't count yourself out before it starts. I think there's a lot of questions or research or things I didn't pursue earlier because I thought like I wasn't smart enough or the right person to be doing that. And I think as I've gotten older, I've realized we're all kind of just like monkeys on a rock. Like we haven't, like no one knows what they're doing. And so if you want to do something, ask questions, go after it, you know, don't, you should never not apply to something because you think you're not qualified because then you're just taking yourself out of the running, you know, wait for, wait for someone to reject you. Right. And so, um, yeah, just pursue more things and don't be ashamed of how earnestly and how passionately you can be into something. Yeah. That's great advice. Is the imposter syndrome amplified further in rocket science? I think so. I think imposter syndrome is baked into everyone to some degree. Okay. Um, and I think aerospace has a lot of, you know, smart individuals, yeah. um, You know, you get people, astronauts who are ex-Navy SEALs and, yeah. you know, have MDs and uh, it's easy to feel like you're maybe not, <laughs> your, your PhD isn't good enough. Um, but yeah, I think it's um, recovering imposter syndrome is how I would describe myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that was the advice to the past. Let's look to the future. What would you like your legacy to be? Wow. Legacy. I haven't thought too much about legacy. Um, 
I think I think individuals, most individuals, um, their legacy is a mount to, you know, like a gust of wind on a ship, right? And you're trying to steer a ship in a certain direction um, because most of us aren't the Elon Musk or the Jeff Bezos of the world. Um, but I think I would like my legacy to be as someone who tried to steer space towards a more welcoming, accessible, and human experience, somewhere that was more accessible, it just, just somewhere, space, like, I think needs to be somewhere where everyone can see themselves. And so I'd like to be someone who helps contribute to that sort of idealistic approach to, um, to living and working in space. I think I'm happy there are people like you, and I think it's more than a gust of wind, who are trying to make space more accessible, more beautiful for everyone else. I'm very happy with that legacy that you might be leaving behind. Final question, what is the meaning of life, Anika Roddick? Ooh, um, I think you're going to reveal that I'm like a little bit of a nihilist. <laughs> I, <laughs> like I, I like grew up on Sartre and like <laughs> just like existentialist. So I think when I was like growing up in high school and I like realized there were philosophers who were like, life is meaningless. I was like, that's so deep. But then I realized and thought about it. I was like, oh, like that's actually so freeing because like that's great news because if life has no inherent meaning, then I think our goal is just to like, you make it up. You just find your own meaning. Um, and I think that can be scary, but I think of that as an opportunity to imbue everything with meaning, whether it's your hobbies or your friendships or the work that you do every day. Um, and so I think part of the work and the meaning of life is to find that meaning. What are the goals that give meaning to your life? I don't think about my life too much in terms of goals. I think more about it as like everyday actions. Um, so I, I love, like I said before, I love to get out into nature. I do a lot of cycling and running. I used to be a rower. Um, and so I think just experiencing the world through that sort of activity is really, really uh, powerful. Um, I like to give back in ways that I can. So I like to give talks at middle schools and planetariums and museums because like there's something so heartening to see like young kids really into space or into anything um, because you can kind of give them an example or give them advice and encouragement in ways that I think um, kids need and like thrive on, frankly. Um, and then, yeah, besides that, just like doing good work through Aurelia and then in my free time, I love to just experience my, my personal kind of art of choice is books and, and writing. Um, and so I love to, you know, write short stories and read different authors, read, read widely um, and just kind of experience different kind of lines of thought like that. I love it. Anika, thank you so much. If people want to connect with you, find out more about you or the work that you're doing at Aurelia, where can they go? Where can they find you? Yeah, I think, uh, well, the Aurelia website is a good place to start. Um, you can see a lot of the work that we're currently doing. Follow along, sign up for our newsletter where you can uh, get some of our results if you want to see photos from the Zero G flight um, and other conferences that we're putting on and things. Um, Personally, uh, I am on Instagram and Twitter. I'm not as active on Twitter these days, um, but you're welcome to reach out through either of those social media platforms. Um, I do also have a website, and so you can, it's just my first name, last name, .com. Feel free to reach out if you have questions. Um, and yeah, thanks for having me. This is a great talk. I think the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much. Yeah. 